Welcome to The Art of Catholic. My guest today is a second timer on the show. Uh, a couple of years ago, I interviewed a gentleman named John Edwards, who told his really incredible and radical conversion story, which involved you know, drugs and jail and, and all kinds of miracles from our Lord. And it's a really beautiful story. I'm going to put a link uh, to the full story in the show notes if you want to go watch that. And I would highly encourage that. But I wanted to bring John back on because since the time of that interview, a lot has happened. He has become one of the leaders of Catholic men's ministry across the country and is really shaking up uh, just everything. <laughs> you can read all about what he's doing at Just a Guy in the Pew. Just a Guy. Yes, that right, John? Just a Guy yes. in the Pew dot right. com. All right. That's right. Make sure I get that right. <laughs> but you can check him out there. And if you're a woman watching this, uh, you know, and you're thinking, well, this is going to be for me because I'm a female. Not a chance. I mean, we're going to talk about things that aren't just for men. What we're going to talk about is the human person. Uh, it's for everybody. Uh, because what we're going to talk about and we'll go as the Lord moves this, but brokenness, uh, the cry of the human heart, healing, uh, and wherever else, again, the Holy Spirit leads us. So, John, welcome back to The Art of Catholic. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. It's great to be with you, my friend. Uh, the first thing that came to mind, you said not just for men, and I thought about both of our haircuts <laughs> when you said that. I thought maybe we need just for men. I don't know, but <laughs> listen, I'm I am feeling you. I you know what's so crazy is bald guys have issues that guys with hair don't. Okay, that's right. <laughs> Let's just get that. I mean, first of all, bald is beautiful. But I was I had a speaking engagement. I literally just flew home from yesterday morning, and the day before I left. I was picking my daughter's car up from a, a body shop and I was looking down at my phone as I was walking in and the garage door was dropped down three quarters of the way. and I didn't realize it. And I walked in and just clocked my head. Oh, man. And I mean, I'm seeing stars and all that. I mean, look, you can see a little bit of a mark up on sure, top of yeah. there, right? And, and I thought, this is so typical guy too. I'm like, I got to fly the next day. <laughs> and I'm like, everyone's going to see this, right? And I'm like, I, but the first thought was, I don't want to go get stitches. Like the last thing I want to do is go get stitches and go through all that when I got a fly out in the morning. And yeah. so I did what any guy does. I went home and told my wife to super glue my head together. <laughs> <laughs> imagine it must have been like a gong when you came into the garage. Just <laughs> boom on the door. Oh, Matthew's here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but when, when they did it, it was like a sitcom because my daughter is pressing my head together. My wife was putting the super glue glue on and my daughter didn't get her fingers out of the way in time and her two <laughs> fingers were glued to my head and then and then, so then she's got to pull them off and it's like taking hair out i'm like oh i don't have much gosh. to give you know that's right oh, it, it was so classic i would have loved so, to have been sitting there watching that <laughs> it was not fun while it was happening but it makes a good story <laughs> sure sure oh man we digress huh <laughs> yeah no kidding <laughs> So I mentioned last time or at the beginning here that you, the last time you're on the show, you gave your conversion story, which has touched a lot of people and it's really powerful. And for those people who have not heard it, uh, would you please just give us kind of the Reader's Digest condensed version of how you got to where you are now? Sure. Yeah, I will. And first, I just want to say thank you, Matthew, because you were one of the first people that ever had me on and, you know, the encouragement you gave me, uh, just your friendship over the years, you've just become such a good and close friend. Uh, I really appreciate all of that. And for you giving me a platform to be able to share about what the Lord had done in my life and what he's doing now. So thank you again for that, my friend. But nice. yeah, my, my pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. So a uh, short version. I was born here in Memphis, still live here, 45 years old, married with three kids um, and grew up Baptist here in Memphis for about 18, 20 years of my life. Uh, most of my friends went off to college and I lost my community with my youth group and my church. Uh, the next age up was well above my parents' age for something to do after you were in the youth group. So I enrolled at the University of Memphis, didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, it was very lonely going to school and just working and all those things. And so I joined a fraternity and it was one of the worst mistakes I made in my life mm -hmm. because it was just not for me. I, I, I didn't realize I had father wounds and uh, a lack of affirmation in my life and that I had you know places that really needed healing. So I looked for those things in other people and other things. And in the fraternity, I wound up working my way into groups, you know, trying to fit in, trying to be cool, trying to belong with folks that, you know, did a lot of drugs and drank a lot and womanized and all those things. So that's what I started doing too. Before long, I had done every drug you could, you could think of, every pill from a pill cabinet, LSD, ecstasy. Uh, and then I made a horrible 
decision in my life one day to do cocaine. And that decision followed me through 17 years of my life. I was uh, working in an auto parts company and had been from high school all the way to college, dropped out of school um, and, and continued this job. But I wound up becoming a Fortune 250 salesman of the year, multiple years, and was making over $200,000 a year before I was 24 years old with a massive drug problem that nobody knew about. Um, you know, I, I fully, full heartedly believed in the way that I've been raised and so many be uh, men believe they have to be is a one man army and, you know, shove things down. Don't talk about them, you know, be, put your head down, work hard, never complain, never have emotions, never have feelings, never ask for help. If you do, you're not a man. So I went about life that way. And I was a chameleon among men from eight to five. I was Johnny on the spot. I was selling things all day long, killing it at work, but at home. I was binge drinking and, and doing drugs behind closed doors. And it was that way until uh, really God brought me to my knees in a, in, in a jail cell. Uh, along the way, between those two things happening, all the party and stuff, I lost a lot of friends in my life. I was doing it myself, going to work, just making money, doing drugs. But I met a girl that was Catholic uh, that I wound up marrying, who's the angel of my life. Her name's Angela. And she told me along the way, the guy she was going to marry was going to be Catholic. So I thought, well, heck, I'd given up my faith and didn't practice anything more. My relationship with Jesus was basically just, hey, God, I need this every once in a while. And that was it. Um, but Angela and I fell in love. I never really told her the truth at all about what was going on in my life. I never took the Catholic faith seriously. And this went on for uh, multiple years after the birth of my three children uh, until finally in 2016, during Holy Week, I was brought to my knees and uh, wound, wound up, found myself in a jail cell in downtown Memphis on a felony charge of the possession of cocaine on Holy Thursday. I was arrested on Holy Thursday mm -hmm. after I'd made God a promise the previous weekend before, uh, during the confessional at a men's conference that I was going to change my life. Obviously I didn't keep that promise and God put me in a place where I'd have to finally sit down and look at him. And in that moment, he came into that jail cell, uh, in the midst of me saying, how did I get here? And finally admitted that that I had do, been doing nothing but lying and I'd been selfish and living for myself. And all I wanted was a chance to be the husband and father I should have been. Uh, in fact, in that jail cell, I remember saying to myself, at least now I don't have to lie anymore. At least now everybody will know who I am. And the Lord came in and he showed me this young evangelist I had been in the Baptist church and I was always involved in the faith. And he started saying, look, you were joyful then and you haven't been joyful in a long time. And you can be that again if you allow me in your life. And so I begged him for a chance to change my life. I surrendered my life to him there. I, it had been so long since I prayed, Matthew. I didn't even remember how to do it right. But I just kept telling him, I, I'm, look at what I've done. I've failed. I can't do this alone. Please come back into my life and give me a chance to be the husband and father I should have been. So he did. My wife is a saint. She didn't divorce me. It wasn't, uh, she will tell you it had nothing to do with me and everything to do with the vows she made to God in the church that day. After that, the next year, I realized I had to be different. You know, that very first weekend when I came home, I got out of jail on Good Friday, and I went to my dad's farm for Easter away from my family, and some crazy stuff happened there. Again, folks can go check out the previous video on your on your channel that we did together. But long story short, I, I spent a year realizing that I couldn't just quit doing drugs and binge drinking. I had to be different. I was still the same selfish guy inside and the same person that was broken, so I had to start working on myself. So I started praying every day. I had a priest take me under his wing and made me go to confession every Friday and made me go to daily mass every day and and uh, showed me how to be a lector. And so I became a daily communicant, and I still am today. Uh, the Lord changed my life through the Eucharist and, and through the Holy Mass. And that priest said, hey, you could probably do something for other men. And so uh, a year after I'd been working on myself, I'd read 40 Catholic books or something like that. <laughs> um, I started... Uh, I started a men's group. I walked into a room and basically told 30 men that we had randomly called and didn't tell them what we were doing. All the brokenness of my life, scared to death, not crying, thinking I'm going to get kicked out of the school or going to get kicked out of the parish. And when I sat down after telling my story, I said, I can't be the only one who's broken. And all these men basically one by one stood up like pistons in an engine, up, down, up, down, sharing the brokenness of their life. And it was the night that God showed me the power of vulnerability in a person's life. And tied that to second Corinthians chapter 12 with my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness started realizing the world tells you that to weakness for a man means terrible things and it's not manly at all. And it's, it's the opposite of what you should be. But honestly, who cares what the world thinks? God says that in your weakness, you find power and it's his strength that we've needed all along, not our own. So 
Matthew, that group changed my life. We've been meeting every Wednesday night for eight years. And along the way, people started asking me to speak. We started the Just a Guy on the Pew podcast, which took off. I, I never would have thought that, but it's been listened to all over the world. And, and now we speak in conferences. And our main goal is to go and to start life-changing, vibrant ministry to men in parishes where guys can find what we found uh, and, and develop real authentic friendships, first and foremost, with Jesus and with other men. Yeah, and just let me uh, plug that because if you are a man in a parish right now and you are considering a, a men's speaker or you want groups really particular formed in your parish, because that's the goal here, right? It's mm -hmm. establishing these communities of men. Go to just the guy in the pew uh, and and check it out because this is your specialty. This is what you do, and the Lord has gifted you mightily, and He's used the story of where you've come from. And, and it turned it into something beautiful and powerful for the kingdom of God. And it's a beautiful thing because the Lord always writes straight with our crooked lines, right? And yeah. he took the crooked lines of your life and he has used it to help other men. And I'm curious in the dealings that you have had with other men, what's the most pressing problem that you encounter? I mean, we, we know there's pornography and all this, but is there something mm -hmm. deeper than that that is really kind of haunting men these days? Yeah, it's it's just their inability to believe that they're worth something. Hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, Matthew, they're worth. I mean, this is this is the work of Christ. This is the work of the church is to constantly preach to each and every one of us that we're valued, not because of anything that we've done. And again, that's what men are told their entire life. If you, you know, excel in school, if you excel at sports, if you get this job and make this amount of money, if you marry this type of woman and have this many kids and a white picket fence and this size house and a boat, and then maybe you'll be worth something. But what do we find through that? Every time we achieve something, we still don't feel any different than we did. There's still a void. There's still something missing. And yet we live in a, in a world now where men, masculinity is called toxic. It's confusing for men to, to even know what it is to be a man. And what can I say? What can I not say? What can I do? How am I supposed to live? So what a lot of men have done is they pulled themselves into isolation and, and they're experiencing great loneliness. We have a, a, you know, we talked about the pandemic of COVID and all those things, but there is an epidemic <laughs> If that's the right word, I don't know. Somebody smarter than me will have to tell me. But, like, but there's a pandemic, epidemic, something of loneliness in our country for men. And men have been told, like I said earlier when we were talking about my story, hey, grin and bear it. Rub some dirt on it. Like, get up, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and, and be a man. You don't need anybody or anything. And if you do, you're weak. You're a loser. You don't matter. You're not a man if you can't figure it out yourself. And I can tell you that nowhere in the gospel of Jesus Christ did I ever hear him say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and do it yourself. In fact, everything he says is different. It's a call to relationship, right, to community. So when he asked the apostles, when he called them, what do you seek? What are you looking for? Come and see. My, 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 my burden is, is easy and my yoke is light, or my burden is easy and my yoke is light. Everything he says is inviting us to come into him. And how do we find him, Matthew? Not just in ourselves. I mean, yes, we can, but also in others, in community, right? And, and so, so many men are out there to answer your question. They're out there trying to do it by themselves. I mean, I speak with guys that I work with on, on an everyday basis, like people that do what you and I do. And at the heart of when you really get them to open up, they feel just as broken as anybody else. And they struggle to believe that they're, they're still worth God's love. And this is people like you and me that do this for a living, right? Like, so what happens to the people that are, that are in a gutter somewhere that, you know, I, Matthew, since Easter, in my own life, in my own diocese, I've had 10 to 12 guys reach out either through my wife or someone who knows me that are struggling, guys that are, that are doing this alone. And because of that, they, they found themselves in, 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 in emotional um, relationships with other people other than their wife. They've, they physically cheated on their wives. They're, they found themselves in alcohol and drugs and pornography. Uh, two men called me in the midst of seriously in the moment contemplating taking their life. Mm -hmm. And so what we see is the, is the, I guess, the symptoms of what we often talk about in our culture, right? Pornography, divorce, uh, abortion, all of these things that are these main issues. A lot of it stems from this isolation, this loneliness that we all feel, whether it's men or women. And we look to other things because we simply believe that if we need help, then we're a failure. 
And, and, and the thing is, none of that is true. You don't get to tell God what you're worth, right? And so many of us, we don't understand that. So we've, we, there's two ways that I tell men all the time that we come out of things or that, that we're going to deal with the things in our life. One, in a virtuous and holy way, right? Where we, we reach into go to the Lord and the Holy Spirit and the Catholic Church and the truth of our faith and constantly preach the truth to ourselves, find other people and community to constantly walk with, to help us grow and for us to give that gift back to them. Or we believe this nonsense of the world, the flesh, and the devil that seek to isolate because the devil's, devil's a sniper. He wants to put one in your gut, not, not in the head, because he's not merciful. He wants you to slowly bleed out and take a lot of people with you. So you either deal with it in that wholesome way or you try to go it alone and you wind up a casualty of the world, the flesh, and the devil because you're not meant to do that alone. That's why Jesus sent out to the disciples two by two and why he always called people into relationship. Yeah, I think that underlying theological reality that you're really speaking to is the fact that God is family. Like the Trinity yeah. is a communion of persons. And the reason why we can deal better with in relationship with each other is because we were made for relationship yeah. in the divine family of God. And so you and I are brothers, literally, through the mystical body of Jesus Christ because of the sacraments, right? And this yeah. is a, a way that we were kind of raised uh, not to look at it that way, so to speak. Like you, we mm -hmm. used to call, you know, as Protestants, and this isn't to denigrate Protestants at all, but this is a theological difference. We would call each other brothers, right, or mm -hmm. sisters, but there wasn't a reality there because we didn't have the sacraments. So mm -hmm. even though baptism was efficacious as a Protestant in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we didn't believe that it did anything to us other than a public profession of the faith. But as Catholics, we believe it incorporates us into the family of God because we're joined to it through Jesus Christ. And this movement through the rest of our lives is supposed to be done in the community of the mystical body of Jesus Christ in relationship with other believers. And to your point, the world doesn't want us in communion with each other. I mean, and they certainly know that men coming together in particular, I think women more naturally form relationships and bonds, mm -hmm. right? Men just don't naturally do it as well. And we have to be brought out of ourselves. But what it speaks to again, too, is our, our value. You mentioned that men just don't see themselves as valuable unless we accumulate things or whatever it might be. And yet we can never scratch that itch that we yeah. want more. And the reason why is because until we understand that we are literally sons and daughters of God, made for and destined for his divine family, then we're going to keep trying to fill it up with all other things, right? Yeah. And it's just the new car smell always goes away. Like the, nothing <laughs> is going to satisfy us. And that's really what I think you're speaking to. Yeah, no, it is. I, I often say that when I'm speaking is, you know, we all... You, know, you get like I bought a new truck a couple of years ago, the first new vehicle we'd had in a long time. I rode and, in it, uh, man. Yeah, I know. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so we're sitting there and like for the first six months, I'm like, nobody breathes in here. Nobody touches anything. Like this car is going to, I'm washing it like every hour on the hour, you know, outside, and, you know, looking at the black carpet for specks of dust. <laughs> And then like six months later, there's like McDonald's wrappers in the back. There's like boogers on every window for not mine, from my kids. <laughs> like, it's just like, well, I just want to clarify, they weren't my boogers, but like, but it's just like, it's another thing that goes away. And, and this is, this is where I think it goes to the point of men and women together. You know, you talked about the shows for everybody. And it really is, even though we do men's ministry in our parish missions, everything we speak about is identity, who you are, who's you are, and what you're here for, right? A relationship with Christ. And I think what this speaks for is like, it, it speaks to is we continue to get these things, but they just aren't, they never fulfill us, right? And people say, I just want to be happy. But the point is not to be happy, it's to be joyful. You know, happy is fleeting. And, and Christ didn't say, I came to me so that my happy will be your happy and your happy will be complete. He said, my joy may be in you. And that joy is found not in things, but in relationships and in peace. And first and foremost, a relationship with Christ. I mean, that's, that's what changed my life. In that jail cell, he came and he met me, and it was reintroducing himself to me in his invitation. You know, sometimes in our faith, in the Catholic Church, we have beautiful traditions and beautiful rituals and beautiful rites and all of those things, but sometimes the relationship with Christ can get lost in that, mm -hmm. right? We, we kind of go and it's like, well, I'm going to do all these things because if I do all these things, then at the end of the week, I'll feel really Catholic and maybe I'll avoid hell. 
Well, the point is not to avoid hell. It's to do everything you can to get to heaven, to be with the Lord who is your best friend and your Lord, the, the love of your life forever. But we can get so drawn into these just, well, I'm going to pray this devotional because these people said I should and I should do this. But we often forget that every one of those things is to draw us back into that relationship with Christ. And as you well know, Matthew, that relationship with Christ is what informs you about the truth about your, about him, first and foremost, and his Father, and then you, with the power of the Holy Spirit that ri- resides in you, so that you can understand, okay, there is a God, and he is not some judgmental, angry police officer that wants to, like, that's keeping up with everything I do wrong and can't wait to send me to hell when I die. Like, that's not who God is. God is a loving Father who has sent the one thing that he loved more than you or I to die for us so that we could be there for him forever, with him forever in heaven. And so when we start to understand that, like, I'm beloved, I matter. And that's what I tell people when I go speak. I'll say, guys, like, you think that that God is sitting up there disgusted with you. But here's the thing. At the end of the day, God knew everything you were going to do in your life before he ever made you. And he still decided to make you in spite of all those things he knew you were going to do wrong. What does that tell you? That God's not up there looking at you at like some disgusted thing, the way we might have looked at our father or or somebody in authority that we were we were wounded by when we were young or didn't have the best relationship. He's up there rooting for you every day. And yes, he wants us to repent and return to him. But that's the thing. God doesn't care what you've done in as much as you repent of it. If you don't, that's when he cares. He cares about what you have the potential to do. And the thing is, we have to get all this junk out of the way and start listening to the right voices in our life. You know, it's it, like, I don't know about you, Matthew, and I'll say this sometimes when I'm speaking is like, how many times do you feel like you've had a conversation all day long and you've never said a word to anybody, right? And it's just in your head. And most of the time that conversation is negative. Like you're, it's just all day long, you're beating up on yourself. And this is where so many people find themselves when they don't know the truth of who God is. It's one thing to know it here, but to know it here in your heart where it transforms everything and you build that relationship, then you can start preaching that truth. And and Matthew, this is why I think so, pe- so many people are broken and lonely and why you look at suicide rates today and they're higher than they've ever been. And 73% of suicides are from young men right? From young men that just simply believe there's no reason for me to live because I've believed all the garbage in my head that is not from me or from God. It's from the evil one. And so we simply pull back, we isolate, we stop having friendships. If we do, they're friendships of convenience. They're not real authentic friendships. I'll go to a conference. You know, I was one in in Columbus with like 3,000 men. And I asked him, I said, how many of you have real friends, like authentic friends in your life? And every hand went up in the room. And I said, how many of you guys have somebody you can call right now and tell them you struggle with porn? And every hand in the room went down for like, except for like four, maybe. And this is the truth. Is This is the point to why you asked me, what do I think is, is the real problem at the root of it is people just simply don't believe they're good enough and that they're worth anything. And we're really good at putting on smiles and I'm fine and I'm fine and putting on masks. And Lord knows I did that for years and years in my life. But at the end of the day, we all know we're broken. So why not spend the energy trying to be better instead of trying to act like we're not broken? Yeah. And I would also add to that. I mean, you know that I'm always hammering on the life of prayer, right? Oh, yeah. Because you cannot, you can't know who you are in relationship to Jesus Christ unless you're in conversation with Jesus Christ. I mean, this is the catechism says that prayer restores man to God's likeness and enables him Mm -hmm. to share in the power of God's love. And so, prayers where Christ kind of seeps into us because you become like the people you hang around with. Right. And so you need to hang out with the number one guy uh, instead of just the guys who are going to use their bowling words all the time. Right. At at, at home, (laughs) you you need to be with Jesus. So he becomes a part of you. And that's where you begin to understand your identity of who you are. And obviously it's not just for men, it's for all of us, right. For for everybody as well. And children, everybody, because we're made for that relationship with him. And so if you don't have a life of prayer, then even other relationships ultimately are going to fall short because you have to have that primary relationship with Jesus and your relationships with other men or other women uh, should help to inform that relationship, the primary one with Jesus Christ. 
And so if you're in a group of guys or you're in a group of women who that's not really kind of the fundamental goal, as broken as they, you know, everybody's broken, right? Yeah. But as long as the trajectory of the group and the people are is toward Jesus Christ, that's great, right? Yeah. You, but you have, but it's not a substitute for your own one-on-one with Jesus Christ. That has to be a part of it. Yeah, 100%. That's where I see a lot of guys fail. You know, a lot of people were looking for a quick fix. We want to feel better. Right. I mean, often Tom's confession, I hate to say this, could be, but can be treated like that reconciliation where we're going because we want to feel better or we want to receive the Lord in the Eucharist, which are good things. But at the end of it, when we go to confession, we're going to basically say, Lord, I'm going to do everything in my power not to do this again, to repent and change my life. Right. And, and so often, like I see it in men's groups, too, and in women's groups, it's really all ministry It is just like I'll go. And then I feel better because I've done something. You can sort of experience these same things at conferences and weekend retreats where you go up the mountain and, you know, we're all like Peter at the transfiguration. Let's stay here, you know? (laughs) And Jesus is like, man, we got to go back down the mountain. Like, it's not about being here or here. It's about being here. And it's exactly what you say. Like, you have to have your own spiritual life. No one can do it for you. And a lot of times I'll see people come in and they're having real problems and then they get kind of their shot of Jesus, if you will, not to be like, you know, um, inconsiderate of, of our Lord, but just to say like this, this, this cheap shot of, of, of mercy in the moment and think, okay, I'm all better. Now I'll just go live my life by myself. And what happens, we get in that cycle where we repeat everything. And it's like scripture says, you return to your vomit like a dog, because you, without that continual grace pouring into your life that you have to seek on your own time, you can't come. I don't care what group it is, one of ours or any other group that's out there, no matter how great it is, you cannot consistently be the Christian that you're called to one hour a week. You cannot. You have to fortify that time and those relationships with your own spiritual growth. And it's exactly what you talk about. I mean, this morning, Matthew, I got up, I hit my knees before I, you know, my feet hit the floor. Lord, help me to surrender your will today. Help me to understand what it is. Help me to live for others. You know, just a, just a quick, I love you, Lord. Thank you for waking me up for another day and help me to put you first. And then the office of the readings, right? I read that this morning. I prayed before you and I got here. I'll go to mass after we're done. And then I'll, I'll, I'll open the scriptures at some point this afternoon and play a little Russian roulette with the Bible and see what Jesus has to say, right? And those things in my life, and, and it's necessary because if I don't do that and I'm not feeding myself, then I can't feed others, whether it's in a men's group in my parish or, or my family, more importantly, or, or anybody on any of these things that you and I do. So we have to realize that you're hundred percent right. Like prayer, the liturgical in St. or Pope Benedict the 16th says this is that we need the liturgical life of the church, scriptures, prayer. That's how you develop a real encounter in relationship with the Lord Jesus. And until we do that, another quote from him that I'm going to butcher, I'm sure. But he says, until you really encounter Christ, you will see your faith as nothing but institutional. And it's why most people don't see it as a source of joy right? Because it is all about that relationship. But just like any relationship in our life, Matthew, we have to pour time into it. Just like your relationship with your spouse or your children, or if you want a good relationship, you have to spend time with it. And no one can do that for you. Not me, not you, not the men in the group. You have to do it. Hey guys, we'll be back to the interview in just a moment. Are you or a group you're part of seeking authentic Catholic spiritual teaching that will finally provide understandable, serious formation and direction? Do you want to learn to pray more deeply and make actual spiritual progress? If so, I'd like to introduce you to the Science of Sainthood. It's an online teaching program that offers step-by-step Catholic spiritual formation for people who are ready to move into a real relationship with God. Featuring a series of beautiful bite-sized video courses, meditations, and scripture laid out in a particular order, you'll finally discover a clear path to holiness. We also offer video studies for parish groups with workbooks and leader guides, as well as individual courses for personal study. Based on spiritual giants like Saints John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, and many others, the science of sainthood is dynamic, practical spiritual guidance specifically designed to draw you into a closer communion with God. You've never seen anything like this until now. Go to scienceofsainthood.com and experience what tens of thousands of Catholics the world over have already discovered. Scienceofsainthood.com. More than education, this is transformation. 
And I would say something to people you know, who are listening to this right now, and they're like, okay, you guys are talking about a life of prayer. You know, I, I've, I hear this all the time. I know I need it. I'm not exactly sure how to do it. I would just say this. If you don't have a life of prayer right now, it's not rocket science. I mean, really, and, and when I say a life of prayer, really what we're talking about isn't just vocal prayers and just saying the litanies that we memorize and memorize. All those are good and fine and beautiful and vocal prayer is certainly a part of, of our lives. The catechism says it remains an essential element of the Christian life. What I'm really talking about and what the church is really talking about is meditative prayer. And you have to spend this time in an interior conversation with God. And it's super simple. All you do is take a Bible or, you know, a saint book or whatever, but Bible's the best, right? It's the, it's a divine book. And you read slowly through the passage, slowly, right? And this is after you kind of calm yourself down. You don't want all kinds of thoughts running through your head, but calm yourself down, quiet place, just pop open the scriptures, begin to read one of the gospel passages. If something jumps off the page at you, pause. Just enter into conversation with God about it. You know, Jesus, what do you want me to, to learn from this? What are you trying to tell me? Is there somebody, you know, I need to forgive? Is there something that I need to deal with? Show me. And when that moment is over or you get distracted, go back to your reading, right? And just do that on a repeated basis. It's that simple to enter into this interior conversation with Almighty God. And if you will take 10 to 15 minutes a day and you will spend it, and it doesn't sound like much, but I'm telling you right now, if you've never done it, it will be really hard and you'll get really distracted a lot, which is totally fine. The Lord understands, right? Teresa of Avila says, just give that distraction back to the Lord and he turns it into a prayer itself. But just practice that. And over time, just like anything else that we do, just like a golf game or whatever, you do it more, you get better over time. And realize this is that this relationship through prayer is what you're literally made for. Mm -hmm. And so practice that because as, as you were saying, John, you can't give what you don't have, right? Yeah. You've got to fill up with God so that you can overflow out of yourself. It's not a matter of giving something so you lose it either. That's a that's a problem sometimes. We get so mm -hmm. active that you know, we're just kind of like the grace is flowing out of us as fast as it's coming into us. Sure. We want to be reservoirs, say, says St. Bernard of Clairvaux, where overflows out of us into the fields around us. But you have to fill up with God. And, and just one other point I want to make, Teresa of Avila says that the intellect, so your understanding, your knowledge is a blind faculty in your soul. And what she's basically saying is, excuse me, the, the will is a blind faculty, not the intellect, but you need to inform, inform the will. If you come across situations on a daily basis and you're like, I need willpower to overcome this temptation that I'm experiencing, right? You have to be formed in the faith for the grace and the understanding to really drive that. You can't just, as you were saying before, pull up your, you know, your bootstraps and I'm just gonna force my way through this. It doesn't yeah. work that way. The Catholic faith is beautiful because it's faith and reason. We need to inform ourselves about the faith. It doesn't mean you need to get a PhD in, in theology, but you need <laughs> to know who Jesus is because how in the world can you love somebody you don't know? And I think this is one of the things, frankly, that I'm, I'm sure that you guys probably come across and you have formation in the small groups that you do. Am I wrong? Yeah, no, you're right, 100. percent And we use yours, honestly. I mean, I'm going to give a shameless. <laughs> I, I'm going to give I a shameless. You up. <laughs> I, I'm going to give you a shameless plug here because it's it's the truth, uh, Matthew. I've told you, and I'll tell you a million times. I love you, and I love your work. I, I you have helped my prayer life tremendously through our conversations, um, through the interview you you did one on my channel on prayer that was fant fantastic. Um, you've come on. You've actually done a couple of, of shows on our on my, our our channel and and our show, but. Yeah, I mean, the work that you do there, we use the science of sainthood. And you and I got together actually talking about some of this stuff because um, I told you I didn't want to be a guy that wanted to develop content. There are people that are really good at that. Like like you, you love to do that and you're really, really gifted to do that. I love to do a podcast, but I, I just, I've not been called by the Lord yet to sit down and make a series or something like that for men. So I want people in our groups to be free to use what they want on their formation nights because every parish is different and every parish has different needs. Not everybody needs to hear from John Edwards for eight years of their life every time they go in a room, right? <laughs> but but what I love is we do four different things in our men's group. We have a formation night, a worship night, a service night, and a fellowship night. We really believe in a holistic approach to the man. We need to do these different things. So on our formation in the beginning, before we had what I call the four pillars, those four things, we were kind of showing up every week and just 
excuse my French, ladies and gentlemen, but basically talking about how bad we sucked. We're showing up every week and going, I'm terrible this week. I'm terrible this week. I'm terrible because of this reason. And we never were getting any better. And the Lord just kind of told me, John, it's about discipleship. And this is the issue with a lot of groups, men or women. A lot of times we give people something to do, somewhere to go, but not something to become, right? And this is the issue is I don't need just something else to check off in my life that's Catholic that I can look back and say I did. I need something that's transformative. And so when we looked at formation, it's like you can't, when we were just meeting and doing formation every week, we would spend one hour on lust, you know, week one of the month, and the next week on pride, and the next week on anger. No one can lick those things in an hour, right? You're not going to defeat those things. It takes a lifetime to learn to be humble, right? But what you have a better chance of is when you take that formation night, the first week of the month, we meet on Wednesday. So the first Wednesday of the month, and then you watch something that, that is going to take you on a journey for the next 30 days, right? You don't just leave that there and on to the next thing. You live it through your service. You talk about it during your worship. You live it during your fellowship. And what I love about what you do, Matthew, is you made my life a whole lot easier because every week I was having to go, okay, what did Father Mike Schmidt say in an eight minute video this week? Or what did so-and-so say there? And it was always different. And there was, I wasn't leading anybody there. I w- and, and that's not to knock Father Mike Schmidt's, but we were randomly choosing things in the last minute. And when we did that, we didn't have like, we weren't going A to Z. We were going A to Q to R to B to D. To a. And it's just like, okay, what are we really, where are we really trying to go? But through the science of sainthood, you and I talked and I told you we needed something for groups. And you had this huge, beautifully shot, well done, just amazing work that the Lord has done through you. And you were humble enough to go, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll put these in some packs for groups to be able to do. And I got to tell you something. We have been doing your your total abandonment to the will of God for the since I don't know we're on like episode seven now. So you've given me seven months of being able to know what we're doing, going on a journey, and it is transforming people's lives. First and foremost, my own. Like I I, I mean I want to tell you that I've told you that offline, but but folks, Matthew didn't like slip me a five dollar bill and say go on ten minutes about what I do. This is just me wanting every one of you to know from another evangelist who you don't hear this a lot from. We don't, a lot of evangelists don't talk about other people's things, but I'll tell you all day long, if you're not in the science of sainthood, what are you doing? You should be. And if you've got a group, you should certainly look at his group packs because that total abandonment to will of God, I've been going through things in my own life and changes. I'm, I'm Lord, what do I do in this ministry and how do we grow and what do we do? And I realized I was saying, I, 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 well, in one of those videos, Matthew, you talk about father Chizik and, and, you know, the amazing priest that spent so much time in Russia under so much persecution and and really thought, like, I'm a priest. I've got it all figured out. I've surrendered. And boy, he figured out he hadn't. And through his struggles, I never would have found that book if it wasn't for your series. But I started to read that. And now, like, I've looked at our ministry a whole different light. And I'm spending a lot more time saying, Lord, what do you want? Instead of what is John Edwards, the broken person with no organizational skills, think we should be doing next? But I'll tell you, I never would have had that growth in my life if it wasn't for your wonderful work. And for those of you who run groups, men or women, I know personally because I run one. I don't just talk about this stuff. I run one every single week. And I know what it's like when you go, oh, man, formation's coming. And, man, you know, the, 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 something happened with the dog and the kids have been running crazy and I forgot all about it. And here I am 45 minutes before this thing. And what the heck are we going to do? And then you scour YouTube for an hour trying to find something. You, you argue with yourself about what you should use, and then you dread if it's really going to help somebody or not. Did you pick the wrong thing? Or you can give yourself some peace and use the science of sainthood and know that it's going to help people and that you're going to go on a journey. And you can give yourself a 12-month repeat, reprieve from having to look for content again. So <laughs> that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're very kind. Yeah. The beautiful thing about it is, look, you're right. The, the I produce the content and things, but I don't, I don't, and I'm not gifted in what you're gifted in. And this is one of the things that I think is so beautiful. Here we are brothers in the mystical body and not to make this a mutual admiration society, but I support your ministry. Like (laughs) I give money to your ministry Yeah, you do because I fully believe in what it is that you are doing. And you have a real gift with men and getting them to open up and become vulnerable. And those four pillars are like, they speak to me just sitting here and listening to this. Like, yeah, that's yeah. what a man does. That's what a man needs. 
Yeah. It's not just the pancake breakfast, right? Sure. It's it's everything else, the spiritual life and the active life and all these things have to come together. And I think you've built this in such a perfect way. And just the guy in the pew is really a kind of a, it's a format for people to just get started. You want to know how to do it? Look at what these guys are doing and use their stuff. Because yeah. if men, and we didn't even say this at the beginning. I know people have talked about this a lot, but it bears repeating. The church is going to go the direction that the men in the church go. Amen. It is, you know, and that's not to denigrate the role of women at all. But praise God for the women who have been going to mass faithfully and saying their rosaries and praying and carrying Catholic men on their back Amen. while we've been asleep, right? Yep. Praise God for them. But this is a this is a twofer, right? I mean and, and and we need to be united in this. And men have a role that was given by God. If we don't wake men up, we're going down. And I don't mean the church. The church is always going to exist, right? Yeah. Because we're in union with Jesus Christ, right? And we know what happens at the end. We win. But I'm, a, I'm talking about on a local level. Yeah. Look around your parish. Look at how men, many men are even singing the songs for crying out loud. Yeah. And we know some of the songs are really bad. You know, I don't want to <laughs> dance in the forest and, you know, play in yeah, the rain sure. or whatever. I don't want to do that stuff. Men don't, you know, they don't want to sing that kind of stuff. But I mean, even when there are good songs, once a man kind of, unless a man is engaged, he's not going to engage even in the liturgy. And you're just right. kind of a placeholder there. So we have to wake this sleeping giant. And then thanks be to God. I mean, this is one. Of the, this is what the Lord has raised you up for personally, and there are others around the country doing this as well. And I think, from what it is, you know, you and I both do men's conferences. We travel around and we see this all the time. It's it's starting to happen. It really is. I, I yeah. think that the the Catholic men's movement is is starting to get some legs underneath it, and you're starting to see. It's like turning an iceberg in some ways, but it's yeah. beginning slowly to happen, and I'm excited about it. Yeah, it's 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 a work. I, did. I mean, Matthew, I mean, I've told you this a million times. I just wanted to start a men's group in my parish. Like, I didn't know the Lord was going to ask me to do all this. But I love it because, Matthew, honestly, the Lord did, Jesus did something for me that I could not do for myself. And I, even saying that right now, it's hard for me not to get just very emotional to think about where I was and where I am. And, and, and it reminds me of that line from The Chosen with, you know, I was one way and now I'm completely different. And the only thing that would happen in between was him. So I will know him for the rest of my life. And when you've received that gift and you see the hurting and the and the, the problems that are going on in the world, like how can we sit back and not share that news with someone else? And so right. that's why, like to your point with the men's stuff, it is growing. And what we're trying to do is, as you said, one portion is to start these men's groups because regardless of your personal feelings, I know there's a lot of fighting and arguing about the Pope and all these things, which I don't give two licks about. Jesus made him the Pope argue with Jesus about it. I mean, that's what I, that's my, that's <laughs> yes. my personal opinion, you know, but he says that our parishes, our churches should be field hospitals. And I look around and they're not, they're not like you go into parishes and it's a bunch of people going in there and we're going to mass and we're doing our, our me and Jesus thing in the wrong way, right? Like it's just me and Jesus and I'm not entering into the body of Christ. I'm barring the same building all these people are in to go to mass and then to leave, right? But how are we building relationships? We sit here, I, I travel up north in your area and around that way, and churches are pairing together because they don't have enough people going. They're closing churches. Why? Because our, our parishes just aren't welcoming to people. You know, right. when Angela and I, when I became Catholic, I married Angela, um, you know, we were going to move out from Midtown Memphis to East Memphis to where all the, the Catholic schools were. And so we went to like five different parishes on five different Sundays. And every time she's like, is this the one? Is this the one? Is this the one? And every time I was like, nope, nope, nope. And finally, she's like, you just don't want to be Catholic, which was probably true at the time. But <laughs> the other thing was, I've been in five churches and no one's spoken to me. Like, I'm six foot eight. They saw me, you know, like it wasn't like they didn't like, oh, we missed him. Sorry. The big, ugly, bald guy that's, you know, taller than the crucifix they're carrying down the aisle is standing there. And no one spoke to me. And it really, you know, as a former Protestant, I mean, Matthew, I'll joke about this, but it's true in essence. It, it, before I got out of the car in a parking lot, uh, people, I would have had 17 new friends, but invited to 40 birthday parties. People would have had my social security number. I'd have had 12 cups of coffee. <laughs> right. And. And I'm not saying that we have to do that, but what happens? And there's this push in the church now for like small groups and 
because a lot of times we follow what the evangelicals are doing, right? Small groups, a big thing there. We need small groups here. And what I've seen is like uh, when we have small groups in parishes and, and they're, they're usually meeting out somewhere else, like in Joe's backyard with his four buddies. Well, that's great. But when I'm a guy that is just down in my life, whatever it is, experiencing homelessness, you know, addicted to something uh, in the middle of a divorce, I had a guy reach out yesterday on Instagram and said, thank you for your podcast. They're helping me through. I've recently gone through a divorce and, and it's horrible and, I, and I'm alone, right? Back to our original point. But what if that guy walks into a church, the Catholic church, this big, beautiful thing that's made to draw you into community and relationship. And he walks in to the parish office and says, Hey, I, I need help. Is there anything for men? No, I'm sorry. We don't have that. We failed. We failed. And this is what we're trying to do is to get people to see like, great, look, men's conferences are great. I love to do them, but I've gotten to the point now where I don't do a lot of them unless they're willing to work beyond the conference. Jesus doesn't want one rally day, you know, one day of the year, and then we'll forget about men until 364 days later. We've got to have constant community in our life. And I speak that because if it wasn't for the community I'm in, I would not be the man I am right now. I think I would have fallen back, maybe not into drugs and alcohol, but definitely into selfishness, into unforgiveness, into anger, into ego, pride, all those things. These men keep me that way. And so our ministry we want to build places where men can go. Because as you've said, when men are missing, we're always going to struggle in the church. Angela, my wife, will be the first one to tell you, even though she is a way better Catholic than I will ever be, she will tell you it was when John changed his life and started to lead the family that everything fell into place, that our children started wanting to be altar servers, that they wanted to pray every night, that they wanted to pray the rosary. It wasn't because I'm just some amazing human being they look at the father and there's a point in their life when they get into those teen years, when they start to realize, oh man, I'm not going to be a kid all my life and I'm going to have to grow up. And for whatever reason, they look at the father as the person that's going to show them how to be an adult. And if the father isn't there, it's like two hands coming together, the mother to hand off the child to the father. And when the father's not there, there's this gap and the children fall right off in the middle of it. And this is why we're in the place that we're in. So I would just say to any man listening to this, no matter what's going on in your life, no matter where you are, no matter what your relationship may be with your spouse or your family or, or your friends, there's an opportunity to take the place that God made for you in your life. But it starts with the things that Matthew and I are talking about here. And, and you've got to turn away from the things that you've used for, for um, self-medication, for crutches, for all those things and turn to the divine healer in Jesus Christ and let him into those places. So many of us are holding the things in our life like this, and we have to allow Jesus to come and slowly undo those fingers and get into those things so that we can see and believe that there's a possibility for us to be different. Yeah, and, and that goes for men why, and women. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, for all of us. And I think yeah. the reason why, it just just speaking to the, the whole reason for men and the role they have, we're supposed to be reflecting God the Father, right? Yeah. And that is that is our role in the family. And we all know we all fall short. Yeah. Don't let that keep you from a trying to be that. You're like, I could never be good enough. How am I supposed to be God the Father? You're never, you're never going to be good enough. You're, this is what grace is for. That's what the life of prayer is for. That's what sacraments are for. Yeah. That's what these communions, communions of small groups and, and men's groups are supposed to help you to be that man, right? Yeah. You're never going to achieve full perfection here, but we're all supposed to be in process. And the Lord promises that he's going to make up what it is that we are lacking. And it's funny, I was thinking back to my Protestant days when you were talking about how someone, you know, you would have so many people coming up and saying hi to you sure, already yeah. like before you even get out of the car when we were Protestants. It's funny because the, our separated brethren, which is what they are, right? I mean, they are our brothers in Christ. Yeah. I want them all to be Catholic because I want them to experience what it is that we have. But they are our separated brethren. But what struck me years after I became Catholic is that they were so good at community, even though they lacked the real thing that made us one together with community. the Eucharist, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. and, and it was almost like, they were recreating the wheel. One of the mega churches that I went to for a while in, outside of Chicago, we would have like, it, it was funny because it was like the Wednesday, Thursday services were for like the real Christians. And then the Sundays were the seeker services for people who were completely and utterly unchurched. 
And so what they would do with us on the, on the Wednesday, Thursday night Bible study slash services, we'd have our like 45 minute sermon from, you know, whatever guy. And then they would encourage us to go into the food court that was in the church with like eight restaurants out there <laughs> and like man. break bread together. Right. Yeah. And, and I remember looking back on this and going, Oh my goodness. They're basically recreating the wheel. Like it was liturgy of the word and then liturgy of the Eucharist. You know, I mean, it wasn't the Eucharist, obviously, but yeah. we're listening to the word and we're going and breaking bread together. And I was like, these people are so good at community mm -hmm. and we're so terrible at it as Catholics. <laughs> yeah. And we've got the Eucharist for crying out loud. Yeah, We have got to be better about this in relationship with other people. You're hundred percent right. I mean, it's, like I said, uh, some of the benefits of, of a men and women's group is if you're doing it in a way that that I believe that the Lord wants it to be done, um, you're you're sharing your life with people, and what that does is, is like some guys will come in. I was I had a guy a couple of weeks ago, and he's had some some addictions and things like that, and he came in the room and he sat there with his hat down and he just didn't say anything the whole time, barely looked up, and he shot out of the room. And I followed him out of there and said, "Hey man, well you know you left pretty quickly." How are things? Are you going to come back next week? And, oh, uh, yeah, I just, I can't do all that right now. And I said, you don't have to. You, you, nobody's asking you to come in here and pour your guts out. But did you hear anything from other people? And he goes, yeah, I realized a lot of other people struggle besides me. Right. I'm not the only one. And that's one of the biggest things that you want to get across in a group is that we're, we're all not perfect. We're all broken in some way. And it's not to sit there and compare to go, oh, man, I thought I was bad. Johnny over there, he's real horrible. I feel so much better. <laughs> That's not what it's for. It's, it's, it's to sit there and go, man, like there's a commonality in all of our lives. We are imperfect. We are broken. But you can also see that there's a way to be better by not focusing on the mistakes. It's just like temptation, Matthew. You know, you talked about not trying to will your way and, and growing in the faith and, and understanding it's it's through this, this formation of understanding that it's through God's grace that I can make it through these things. You know, as men and women, we, we focus so much on what we do wrong. You know, we, we, we go into, into confession, and I know because I've done this, I go in there and basically want to hand the priest a baseball set bat and say, beat the heck out of me. Tell me how terrible I am, right? Just, just bruise me up because I deserve it. Instead of looking at it as this is an opportunity to go and experience the grace and understand what true forgiveness is. But so often we, we focus on the fall, not the getting up. And it's when we focus on those things that we continue to live in that manner. And having these groups is, is eye-opening that like I'm not the only one on the mat right now. And maybe we can get up together. And when we fall again, we could be there to help each other up. That's what I love Jesus said to, to Peter. He says, Simon, Simon, the devil has demanded to sift you like wheat. And when you have returned, when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Right, It's not just about you coming out of your mess and then going and living your own perfect holy life over here. It's about using your struggles and your witness and, and the things that you've gone through in your life to reach back and help your brothers. And this is what it's all about. If we focus even in temptation, I tell men, they'll say like, well, I saw this woman going down the street in yoga pants. And then I just went down this thing and I thought about it. So I went ahead and I went through with this sin. And it's like you didn't have to. What, what happened was there, was there was an incident that happened in front of you. There was a moment where you were offered a choice, right? You were offered a choice. And so often we just think, oh, man, I just got to go do it because I thought about it or because this is I'm, I'm this bad person. And I always fall. I know I'm going to. Or we can realize, like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And in that moment, yes, I'm, I'm walking down that yellow line in the middle of the road, and there's a left side and a right side, a vice, a, a vice and towards evil and and, and the wide road that leads to destruction or one that leads to, to the narrow gate, to the narrow road, choosing the right thing. And it's in that, time, in that way, when we're in groups, that we can see people making the right choice again and again, choosing the right path, choosing the better part to, to rob the gospel, choosing the better part where we start to believe that we can do the same thing too. And that we're not sitting here as powerless beings right? That we have choices and through the grace of our Lord, giving us back to the original thing we talked about, you know, um, my power is made perfect in weakness. We could borrow the strength of the Lord to be the people we need to be. But if we're sitting in our homes, isolated and constantly with, with, with our own set of cattails, lashing ourselves about how terrible we are, then that ends in one way, in a way that is not with the Lord, 
in very dire circumstances for a lot of people, or we could simply believe something beyond ourselves that there is a God, that he loves you, that he desires for you to be in relationship with him and other people. And it is completely possible, not on your own, but with his grace and with the grace that he gives others around you. That is our faith. And that is what our parishes need to have, whether you're a man, woman, a child, a zebra, whatever. Like we need to have that for everybody. And in our ministry, as long as God allows it, we're going to do everything we can to help do that. I mean, even Angela's women's group to speak to women here. You know, this four pillars isn't just for men. Angela started a women's group. They were using walking with purpose. After a while, the women were seeing like all the different things we were doing and said, we want to do stuff like that too. So they still use walking with purpose for their formation night. And then they do the other four pillars and they go out and do things women like to do. I mean, they worship, they serve, and then they'll go do stuff that women like to do. And so this kind of thing works for everybody. The point is, it's not about putting a name on it. It's not about me owning anything or the ministry owning anything. The problem in the church is we have three reasons why things don't exist. Father wants one, but he's too busy. I'm I'm swamped. I'm overwhelmed. I'm understaffed. I'm trying to pave the parking lot. I'm trying to administer the sacraments. I'm not going to start something I can't see to myself because I don't want it to fail. Two, the people who feel called to do it are beaten down by their shame because they're listening to the wrong voice in their life, so they never stand up look at the apostles and and look at their lives and see what God did with them for reaffirm reaffirmation here, folks. <laughs> yeah, right. And then, and then three, I'm a super formed person. I can recite the Summa in my sleep, but I don't know how to start a men's group. Like what is, so the thing is we exist to, to give people those things, to take the excuses away. You don't know how to do it. That's okay. We do. And it's not built on you owing just a guy in the pew, your life for the next 20 years or 99, 99 a month. It is, it's, here's the methodology. Here's this, take it, let the Holy Spirit build this for men or women, whatever, whoever's using it into whatever that it needs to be. And then go out and do the things that you're now confident that you can do through the grace of our Lord and through the plan that you have laid out before you. Yeah, that's beautiful. And just to go back to something you said, you mentioned, you know, the, the better part, and this goes back to something we were talking about before. That's Luke chapter 10. That's the Mary and Martha story. Yeah. And that better part that Christ is referencing is what we're talking about in that the better part that Mary chose was sitting at the feet of Jesus Christ and growing in that intimacy and relationship with our Lord. It wasn't that what Martha was doing, running around with a chicken with her head cut off was bad. It was wrong. No, that's the active part. That's that's going out and serving other people. She was making a meal for Jesus Christ for crying out loud, right? Yeah. And he can smell the cooking. He can, you know, it, th- that's a real way to serve. But primarily, everything flows from this interior relationship you have with the Lord. And when you're in that interior relationship through the life of prayer and the sacraments, you can start to understand who you are. You start to experience the mercy of God and your self image changes from what the world tells you it is to a cruciform image of Jesus Christ and being united with him. And my value comes from God, right? And Mm -hmm. once you have that beginning to seep into your bones, you're gonna be able to have more healthy relationships with other people. And one other thing too, you know, you talk about you going into a confessional and like beating yourself with cattails and you're like, you're like, hit me, Lord, like I need forgiveness. A lot of times the issues that we have isn't as much that we haven't forgiven ourselves as we haven't forgiven other people yeah. as well. And our lack of forgiveness to others who may have wounded us and caused us to have this bad view of ourselves, that's something that is really powerful. And there is a There is a healing that has to take place, even of things that have taken place in the past, so that we can see them as God allowed that for a purpose. It might have been bad. He didn't cause that evil to happen in my life, but he allowed it to happen. And if I will see that as as something that he allowed for my good, it allows me to then move on, to get past it, to forgive those people and grow more in the interior life with Jesus Christ and then grow in my relationship with other people. That's that's 100% right, Matthew. I mean, it, it's so many of us, we, we ask the question, why do I keep doing this, right? Like whether it's porn, whether it's anger, whether it's unforgiveness, it's whatever your, your, your you know, sin of not choice, but your repetitive sin is, right? 
we like Lord, why do I keep doing this? And, and, and even St. Paul says, I do not do the good I want to do. I do the That's evil right. I do not want. Like <laughs> even the second greatest evangelist who ever lived by in Christ is like, is saying, I can't, why do I keep doing the wrong things? We all experience this. And to your point, sometimes you, you have to dig deep and this is where the relationship with the Lord is. You have to trust the Lord. Like you're not going to let anybody come close to you in anything that hurts. It's like going to the doctor and you got a broken arm and then he touches the bone sticking out of your arm and goes, that hurt? Yes, it hurts. Like, why are you doing that? We don't trust people to come into those places unless we have an intimate relationship with them. This is why we need to have that with the Lord so that instead of clenching around these things, we let him open them up and pour that healing balm in there. That's what vulnerability is. The Latin root of the word is vulnus, which literally means wound, right? And so you're opening that up so the Lord can pour his graces in there. But I'll tell you, like some of us out here, we're wondering why we're behaving the way we are. And it's probably because some kids slapped us on a playground in third grade that we've completely forgotten about. It embarrassed us in front of everybody. And our whole life, we've had inadequacy wounds and we never understood where they came from. In my situation with my father, he never told me I love you. He never told me he's proud of me. So how did, what did I do? I overcompensated. I was arrogant. I was more than I should be. I had to be the best at everything. I had to be number one. I had to be the funniest. I had to have the last word. And I wondered why I never had real male friendships in my life because people would meet me and two weeks later, they're going, I really don't like this guy. Like, and, and it was because I had wounds with my father and thank God I'll mention a, a, a friend, Dr. Bob Schutz and his work at the JB2 Healing Center. I've spent a lot of time with Dr. Bob and now work alongside them doing healing men's conferences. And if I hadn't dug into those things, I would have still been going into the confessional and going, why do I act this way? Why do I feel this way? But now when I feel something welling up in me, let's say, you know, I turn on something and I see another evangelist and they're doing really well. And then something peaks in me like, well, man, must be nice, right? I mean, I'm human. That stuff happens, right? I can stop now and go, wait a minute. That's not really how I feel. I love that person. And I'm glad they're blessed in that way. This is my inadequacy wound trying to rear its ugly head and basically go to hell devil. I'm not giving into that, right? Like I know that's you and I'm not going to, to allow you to get in that place and stir up those things because our, our life isn't just a, a one-time healing. You're not going to go to confession one time. I mean, for most people and be completely healed of everything you go, you're confessing the symptoms in confession, right? I keep acting this way. And the hope is through spiritual direction, through your own discernment, through the help of the priest in persona Christi in the confessional, you start to figure out what is the underlying root and the cause of these things. Then you can go in and do the spiritual work to understand where that wound came from. What, why is it this? And, and I got to say, Matthew, like, oh man, it was like somebody handed me the key to Fort Knox when I found out my root wound was inadequacy. Because now all these people that I had hurt, all these people that I shot, you know, I jumped down their throat when they said something, asking me a question about something I was doing. And I immediately took it as you're, you're criticizing me, but I'm good. I'm good. I don't need criticism. I don't need your help. Right? Like I would jump at people like that, man, when I figured out I have an inadequacy wound and this is where it came from. I, now I don't have to let it control me anymore. And all the things that I went to, the the porn, the drinking, the drugs, the whatever else you want to say, you know, that I had in my life, the million vices I had, except for coffee. I never drank coffee. I didn't have that vice. But all the other ones, like they go back to this. And with that knowledge now, I can sit here and go, I don't have to give any time to that because I know that's the devil over there trying to gig me in something that he knows is a place that if I let him, I'll go down the toilet faster than a, the water when you flush it, right? In my own life and in my the way I feel personally or anything else. That is the power of what you're talking about, of understanding. And part of that was forgiveness. I, once I realized my dad never received those things I wanted from him. So who was I to be angry at him for something that he never had to give? So in that, I was able to forgive him for those things. For the first time in my life, it's easy to go, I'll forgive you and not mean it and harbor it the rest of your life. But to be taken through like a renouncement prayer to renounce the, the things that happened there, but also to ask God to do what I couldn't do myself. Lord Jesus, I'm having trouble forgiving my father. Please give me the grace to forgive him through you. And right. once that happened, I, I, 
I now have the grace and the gifts to be able to recognize those things and to simply say, as we talked about with temptation and the other things, no, no, I'm not going to go down that path. I'm not going to treat people that way. I'm not going to allow you, devil, to have control of the devil, to have the control of my life. I'm going to surrender it to Christ and I'm going to live as the disciple. And this is why, Matthew, last thing I'll say here about it, it's why it's hard to be a Christian. If you don't think it is, you're not doing it right. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's hard. It's a, it's a constant battle with yourself and with the devil and trying to listen to that small, still voice, which goes back to everything that you and your ministry do is to help people understand and to listen to and define that small, still voice. Yeah. You know, if, uh, Pope Benedict the 16th talks about conversion as a daily thing. It's not a one and done <laughs> thing. Kind of like the way that we were raised, you know, you ask Jesus into your heart and all of a sudden everything's cupcakes and brownies. Sure. It, it just, it doesn't work that way. No. Right? It is a daily turning toward the Lord. And one of the things I'll say too, with regard to that forgiveness aspect or what, whatever your kind of wound is, or even your predominant fault, because every one of us has a particular fault sure. that's heavier than others, just like we're more virtuous in some way, like some mm -hmm. virtues are stronger than others. We got predominant faults as well. Ask the Lord, like the Lord wants to show you, yeah. ask the Lord, you know, show me. Cause this is the, the kind of the, when you sin, when we're in a state of mortal sin in particular, but just sin in general, it blinds the intellect. Like yeah. it makes you dumber, right? And so you can't see yourself and you can't, we, we, we learn to rationalize. We learn to you know, look the other way. We compartmentalize our lives. Like, oh, the, you know, you were talking about this before. I go to church on Sundays, but I go do all these other things. Yeah. Man, in this, even when you are to the point where you are striving for virtue and you really want to be holy, it's very easy to be blind to your own sins. And so yeah. ask the Lord to show you what those things are. And he's faithful to that because he wants to heal you more than anybody else because he loves yeah. you more than anybody else. Yeah. And, and, learning to to see yourself for who you really are right in your own inadequacies because all of us have an inadequacy wound you know on some level yeah. right because of sin but at the same time to understand the grace and the truth and the beauty of Jesus Christ and how he wants to transform you and make you whole and draw you unto himself and, and give you something that you could never get on your own, which is something that goes beyond our wildest dreams. You can't even fathom it, says St. Paul. You know, eye has not seen nor ear heard nor the heart of man conceive what God has prepared for those who love him. That's what this is all about. Yeah, We're, we're moving towards something that is so beyond the human and yet we get distracted by the bright lights and the baubles of this world. And we're idiots at times. Like, what are we doing? Yeah. But the Lord understands because he knows us. He made us. He experienced life as a human. He never sinned, but he was tempted. He understands yeah. temptations. And he is faithful to give us the grace we need to overcome all these things in our lives so that he can make us whole and unite us to himself. That's what this is about. But it's not easy. It is a process. Saints are not born outside of Our Lady, right? Saints are made and we have to be made. I'm reading a book by uh, about Blessed Conchita by Kathleen Beckman right now. And, and uh, Blessed Conchita has this phrase being done and undone mm. over and over in Jesus Christ. And that's really what's happening. We're being yeah. done and undone on a daily basis. That's hundred percent right. We got to quit whistling past the graveyard, right? Like quit acting like you don't see what you see, you know, it, it, to, to your point of what you were saying. I mean, just look at Lent every year when Lent rolls around, you know, and, and you're, you're flying out of Advent school, starting back, whatever kids things going on in your life. And then somebody goes, man, can you believe Lent's around the corner? Ash Wednesday's next week. And you immediately go, Oh man, and your mind goes to what you like, what am I going to give up? And immediately with all of us, it's like, bing, bing, bing. The one thing you need to give up is right there. And you're like, well, not that I'll give up chocolate. Right. These are, <laughs> we all have that thing that we know is not right in our life. And the thing is, you don't have to run from it. You don't have to run from it. The Lord is inviting you. That flashing light is a gift, right? This is the thing that's keeping you from me. This is the reason you keep stumbling and falling. Trust me with it. Allow me into it. Allow me not only to be Lord, but friend, right? I, I, again, scriptures, man, when the Lord says, like, I no longer call you slaves, I call you friends. Things like that that our Lord says over and over again to reassure us. I know the hair is on your head, unless you're Matthew or John, right? It's easy to count those. But all of these things that he says, my house has many rooms. Like, 
He's not trying to steal from you. He's not trying to, to hurt you. He's trying to love you. And the mm -hmm. way he does that is through the things we've talked about here, the prayer sacraments, um, and through community. That's what we need. And, and so many times it's like when you, when you can give those things up, when you finally say, okay, Lord, I know this is might hurt and I know this is going to be uncomfortable, but Lord, like I take this from me, like come into it. There will be a joy in your life that you'll eventually get to that is undescribable. I've found it in my own life to where I realized I have white knuckled the steering wheel of my life, my entire life to the point where I have arthritis. And as soon as I let go, like it was just, oh my gosh, I didn't have to do that. All I had to do was give it to him. And I'm not saying it's easy. You've mentioned, you know, done, undone, all those things. It is. It is a roller coaster. It is some days being beat up, but you know what? It, it's suffering is part of our faith. You know, we're willing to go to the gym and beat ourselves up and tear muscles and all these things so that we're physically fit. And guess what happens? Like eventually, if your if your spiritual life isn't fit in the same way or even more so, then it's all for naught, right? Like our spiritual life and our relationship with Christ is the most important thing in our life. It's what feeds our families. It's what feeds our parishes. It's what feeds our culture. And, and to those out there that go, well, I want to give my life to Jesus, but then I'm going to have, I'm going to lose something. I'm going to have to be different. Yes, you are, but stop counting the cost and start looking at the reward. Because I could tell you, I lost a lot of things, but they pale in comparison to what the Lord Jesus Christ has given me in my life. You cannot be the husband and father or the, the wife and the mother that you want to be unless Jesus Christ is living in and through you to love people only the way that he can. That's the invitation. And the way that we find that is by getting out of our silos, getting out of our too busy lives to start pouring into other people and allow other people to pour into us, to meet us in our brokenness, to be Jesus in our life and to be that for other people. And the reason why First, let me just give a big amen to what you just said. But the reason why this is our reality, see, too many times we fall into this habit of looking at the things that we have to give up or the sacrifices that we make as destroying us. Yeah. And, and the reality is the reverse. It's not a destruction. Yeah. It's a healing and it's a lifting up. And the reason why is because every one of us was made to sacrifice ourselves. Every one of us was made to give of ourselves. You know, everyone thinks that it's better to give than receive is like a Hallmark card. That's in the Bible. That's the book of Acts. Like that. <laughs> and why is that the case? Why is it better to give than to receive? Because we're made for the self-giving, self-donating family of God. And when yeah. we begin to live that way, now we're fulfilled on a level that we could never achieve by white knuckling it and trying to control every aspect of our lives. Because really what that does is we're, we're steering that car for our own benefit. At least what we think is really yeah. our own benefit. Right? Control and the Lord's like, want, yeah. no, man, put it on cruise control, man. I'll take, I'll take care of this and I will guide you in the path that leads to a fulfillment that you can't fathom because I want you to be fulfilled. This is what we don't think about too. God wants our fulfillment more than we do, yeah. right? Yeah. He wants our joy more than we do. And he promises that he will give it to us if we do these things you're talking about. Give of ourselves, you know, be like Jesus. At the end of the day, that's that's what we're trying to do is be like Jesus. Yeah, that's 100%. I, I make less money than I ever made in my life and I'm happier than I've ever been yes. because my, my, my joy is found in him. I mean, it's just, there, there's nobody who knows more that who you're supposed to be than the one that loved you into existence. And that's why he chases after you because he knows that the life that a lot of us are living are nowhere near the potential of what he created us for, not only for, for ourselves and our family, but for those around us. And we just have to trust. We have to trust that he's a father, that he knows better. Just like when we're children and we trust our parents, like they know better when they're saying no to something or they're saying yes to something, it's because they know better. Right. And we have to do that same thing with God is to see him as a loving father that when when something doesn't work out, he's not punishing me. He's not angry at me. He just knows better than I do. And I can't tell you how many times in my own life, Matthew, where I've really, really asked for something and really, really wanted something. And then down the road, I'm like, man, thank you for saving me on that one, Lord. Like right. I it's it's the truth. I mean, somebody told me that yesterday. He was talking about a guy, a girl that he was obsessed with when he was younger and he loved her and he wanted to marry her and all this stuff. And then he's like, years later, 
I'm really glad he saved me from that, you know? That's and a it's Garth like, Brooks song. Yeah, man. it really is. <laughs> Thank God for unanswered prayers. <laughs> yeah, that's right. All we need some trains and some dogs and stuff like that. We'll have a country song. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's the truth, man. And it, it, it is. You're always going to wrestle because the devil's going to tell you, you know, if you give up, if you if you start letting God control your life, you're going to lose this. You're going to miss this. You're going to not be able to do this. You know, and, and honestly, those are probably a lot of things you don't need to be doing in your life. But those are the things he's using to control you. That's how he's putting you in a jail cell and you wind up becoming your own jailer, right? By, by continually going back to those things. But when you have that courage and you finally can, can break through in that moment to really trust and surrender, what you find is not on the other side of this, of this journey, on the other side of this leap of faith, if you will, is not torture and pain and loss and all those things. It's peace and glory and love and hope and mercy and joy and fulfillment, what you've been looking for. I, I tell you, Matthew, like I have, there are so many days where, yes, I can complain just like everybody else. But at the end of the day, I'm grateful for everything that the Lord's doing in my life. And when I live in that gratitude of knowing even the small things, right? If, if you think you're you're not getting a fair shake, if you're afraid of what you're going to lose, write down the things you think you're going to lose and then write down the things that you think you're going to get out of giving your life to the Lord. And I guarantee you it's going to outweigh that other page by by pages, right? And it, when you look at those, you can be grateful for the blessings live in that gratitude, which spurs on generosity. And then you can find that purpose and fulfillment and that joy that we're all looking for, but it happens Amen. through the Lord and it happens together. Amen, man. I, I just looked down the clock. It's like an hour and 15 minutes. Sorry. I'm like, my <laughs> goodness, man, this is blown by. This is yeah. Uh, like we could continue this conversation all day long. Uh, yeah. And this has been beautiful. And I want to reiterate, cause I, we'll, we'll wrap this up, but First of all, I want you to tell people where you can find out about uh, what it is that you're doing. Direct people sure. to where they can learn more about your ministry. Yeah, so you can go to just a goo, uh, just a goo, just a guy in the pew dot com. <laughs> just a goo that probably wind up a place you don't want to be. So just a guy in the pew dot com, and right there we changed everything on the website. When we first started, you know, marketing people said, "Oh, yeah, it's got to be all about you and all that stuff." We've changed all that now to where it's, this is just a guy in the pew. This is the need for men. And this is what we're doing about it. It's very easy there on the page to click a button, fill out a form. Once you do that, you have an option to schedule a call with me too. You'll get me. You won't get somebody else. And we'll talk to you. Now, please, if you're going to do that, be serious about wanting to start a group. But we'll, I'll talk to you about it. We'll hear your situation and we'll formulate a way to help you. What that consists of, Matthew, is just this quickly. We get with you. We get with the decision maker of the parish. If they say yes with the cost and everything else, that, you know, to do all this, then we pick a date. We start working with you. We help you build a leadership team because nobody needs to do anything like this alone. They'll burn out. They'll quit. They'll be resentful. I know because I did it for the first five years by myself and I hated everybody in my group like most of the time because they didn't do anything and I did it all. Just being honest. And then I had to go to confession for that one for sure. But, <laughs> but you know what? Here's the thing. Like we, we'll help you build a leadership team. We'll give you the four pillars. We'll walk with you all the way up into the event. We'll come and do a mission for men and women and everybody in your parish. And then we'll do an in-depth training with your men. We'll help you formulate a plan to build the first three to six months of your meetings and your, what you're doing and all those things. So we're walking with you from the time you call me through the months before the event, at the event and beyond. Because at the end of this, Matthew, we want to build fruit that lasts. So you can go there to the website. We can help you do that. You can check out the podcast there. You can donate. You can do whatever you want. But yeah, you can find it all at justagownthepew.com. I hope a lot of you will reach out because this is what we want to do with our lives. We want to be modern day St. Pauls that are going out there and starting communities where there are no where there is no community. Amen. And like I said before, you know, uh, I, I support you. I encourage others to do so as well. I really believe in what it is that you're doing. It's it's a one stop shop for men's groups, but it, that's something. You know, anytime you start groups, anytime you're doing something in parish life, it should be ordered not just to like it's not just about the group. It's about the transformation of the person, which leads to the transformation of the parish, which Amen. then leads to the transformation of the community, and it so on and so forth. Like it's a ripple effect. You start with one guy, you change his life. And there's that ripple effect that was going to affect so many others. And I yeah. applaud all the work you're doing. I know the Lord has more in store for you. And I'm in awe, like just sitting back and looking at what the Lord has done with you since the time that we first got on together and, and just watching you uh, build this over the past few years and, and really kind of hone what it is the Lord wants you to do. You have a gift for this. You really do. And it's beautiful. 
And uh, I encourage people to make use of it and to, to go to just a guy in the pew and just learn what you need to do in order to help transform the men in your parish. So please support these yeah. guys. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you for having me. Dude, I love you. You, you said it's amazing to see what, what's happened in my life. You're, you've been a big part of that. The Lord sends us saints, and you've certainly been one in my life, man. And I wouldn't be the person I am in doing the things that we are doing without your support, you know, in one way financially, like you've said, but more importantly, just as, as the spiritual guidance and the, and the brother that you become to me. So I love you, dude. Thank you for all you've done. I love you too, Johnny. And I pray that God continues to bless you and, and uh, may the ministry continue to grow. And you know what? May we both become saints. Amen. <laughs> God bless Amen. you. You too. John is doing some great work and deserves support. Check out everything he's doing in his ministry. I'd also like to remind you that as of the time of this recording, so this is May 2024, I'm still planning on leading a five-star pilgrimage to Israel in April of 2025, right? So there's a whole year. Uh, and from what I'm told, not only are operators expecting trips to begin again in just a few months, but yeah, if I give up the hotels and the spaces that we have, five-star hotels, by the way, I'm not getting them back because of the pent-up demand. So in other words, if you want to go, sign up, right? You're going to have to have a spot. Uh, if you want to go, or you're just going to have to wait for a while. So if you're interested in walking in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, uh, if you're interested in going to mass and praying uh, and just being with the Lord in the places where he grew up, all these places that we read about in the Bible, then by all means, go over to scienceofsainthood.com slash pilgrimages. And you can watch a video, a short video that I put together of where we're going and what we're doing. Or if you want to, you can just call 206 Tours directly. That's my pilgrimage company. Uh, you can get all the info from them. And you can do that at 800-206-TOUR. So 800-206-8687. They'll give you all the details uh, about how all this works. And you can just tell them you want information about Matthew Leonard's pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Also, in the interview, you heard John Edwards say that he uses the series from the Science of Sainthood for his formation nights in his men's group. And what he's talking about are the five, soon to be six, beautiful standalone courses that are set up particularly for groups. So they've got workbooks with review and discussion questions, uh, their leader guides, their certificates for the participants. It's basically everything you need to put on a great group experience and fire up the interior lives of the people around you. And really, at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. Like we have so many consolidations of parishes, and you know, priests are over how many different parishes, and and it just seems like things are fragmenting. If you want things to change, if we want the church to kind of turn the corner again or turn the iceberg around, so to speak, it's not going to be through every program under the sun. What we have to do is transform the interior lives of the people who are in the parish. When you get fired up by something, like a movie you see or you know whatever, you wanna tell people about it, right? Well, it's that on steroids when you have an encounter with the divine other. When you meet God and you realize who he is and what he has done for you, and you begin to move down that path toward him and the, the union with him for which you were made, that's when everything changes. So if you want to change your parish, if you want to change the, the, the lives of the people around you, starting with your own, then you have to get serious about the interior life. Jesus said it's the one thing necessary. That's what the science of sainthood is all about. And if you want to get a feel for what the entire science of sainthood program is like, you can do that. Uh, just go to scienceofsainthood.com and there's a free trial you can engage in. You can get access into uh, totally free, totally free. Let me repeat that. Totally free. No cancellation. There's no credit card. There's no bait and switch here. Okay. Just sign up and watch the first course. You get a couple of weeks in it. It's called Catholic Mysticism and the Beautiful Life of Grace. And my guess is it's full of content you have never seen before. All right. Again, scienceofsainthood.com. Or if you're in the United States, you can just text the word saint to the number 66866. You can get access that way. So the word saint, text the word saint to 66866. And again, that only works in the United States. So there you go, right? Pilgrimages, group studies, 
uh, step-by-step spiritual formation. It's all about getting closer to Jesus Christ so that not only can we spend an ecstatic eternity with him, but our lives right now can be radically transformed. We can be changed now. We can become to, uh, begin to acquire that likeness to Jesus Christ for which we were made. Right? We were made for the divine family of God. We need to start living like it now. But you can't do that unless you have that deep relationship with our Lord. That's what the science of sainthood is all about. And somebody who knew all about uh, the interior life and radical transformation is St. Paul. So let's close as we always do with the words from Romans 12, 12. Rejoice in hope, endure in affliction, persevere in prayer.